I'd like to welcome you to this morning's webinar and begin by wishing you happy Halloween. Um, I'm pleased to have you all here today. This has been a collaborative effort, of course, and I'm very happy to see many people joining us here today. I cannot see on my screen just how many, but I've been advised there will be quite a few, so I'm pleased to welcome you all here today. Now, I could speak at length about HELC, about HOLAS 3 and what it means and where it's going to take us or where we hope it's going to take us, but I'll be perfectly frank, I've been asked not to do that, and I'll be happy to comply with that because, of course, um, we have a very tight schedule today. And in any case, um, in just a few minutes, um, we will have somebody taking the floor who is infinitely better placed to do that and who can explain it all to you, and that, of course, is Yannicka Haldin. Now, I would like to say a few words, though, um, and I'd like to begin by saying that despite the date we've chosen for this webinar, it's not our intention to frighten you, let alone horrify you, but I think it's fair to say that this latest um, uh, assessment in a series of holistic assessments of the Baltic Sea does offer some cause for concern because despite progress in some areas, we simply have to acknowledge that the Baltic Sea is not in good shape. It's not in good condition. Now, it's not all in doom either. Um, this much is clear. I think we also have reason to be optimistic. And the reason for that is um, that we know a lot now. And if you uh, look at the program of, of uh, this morning's webinar, you'll see that the theme of the panel is, now that we know, where do we go? And I think, Thanks to this um, holistic assessment, this latest holistic assessment, we know quite a lot more than we knew just a few years ago. And that, of course, can and will be the basis for informed action um, to protect the Baltic Sea and to improve the condition of the Baltic Sea over the next couple of years. And the other reason for optimism that I think we have is uh, that, in fact, um, we, um, of course, have the policy instruments at our disposal to do this. And I'm referring most notably, of course, to our 2021 Baltic Sea Action Plan with its 199 actions, the implementation of which has now begun and will need to be concluded by 2030. If we do that, also based on the information we can glean from this holistic assessment, I think we have a good chance of uh, considerably improving the condition of the Baltic Sea and making good progress towards achieving good environmental status for the Baltic Sea. So yes, but this is um, a recurrent theme in one of our um, HELCOM presentations. Yes, but we've made progress, but we're not where we want to be. <clears throat> but we can be optimistic because we have a lot of knowledge and we have a lot of policy instruments at our disposal to make use of that knowledge. Now we need to implement. I think that is the key point at this point in time. Now, the uh, second thing I'd like to say, because I'd like to be very brief, is that as you know, this uh, report, this whole assist, uh, holistic assessment is the culmination of many years of intense effort on the part of staff here at the Secretariat and of many, many people around the Baltic Sea, many of you as well. And I'd like to take this opportunity once again to thank everybody who has been involved and um, who's uh, contributed to delivering what I think is a highly useful and a highly remarkable report. Um, and a very helpful product in working towards achieving good environmental status for the Baltic Sea. And I'm getting a blip here on my screen, which you may possibly hear. I see there's 190 of you. So welcome to all 190 of you. Um, and um, I hope we're gonna have a wonderful morning, a very inspiring morning. And with that, I'd like to hand over to our excellent moderator, Gun. Gun, take it away. Uh, good morning and thank you very much, Rudiger. So this was actually Rudiger Schrempel, who is the Executive Secretary of Helcom speaking and giving us this nice introduction. Thank you. So my name is Gun Rukvist, and I've had the honor and pleasure of being your moderator today. So I'll try to keep us on track and guide us through today's webinar. In total, one and a half hour. And we will first begin with the presentation of the report. And thereafter, we have some excellent panelists who will be discussing around the report. And then we will continue with a large and long Q&A session. So please, everybody, you can, meanwhile, during the, the presentations and the discussion, you can put your questions already now in the Q&A. And you can also vote on the questions so the most popular ones get picked up. And we will, of course, do our best to try to answer as many questions as possible. 
But with that, I hope we will all have a very fruitful and interesting discussion, no doubt, and we will get right on to the program. So I would first like to welcome Jannika Haldin. You are the Deputy Secretary General of the Helcom, and you've also been the lead of the whole HOLAS 3 process, the large work and long work with the assessment. So you will now give us an overview and a highlight of what's in this amazing report. So please, Janneke, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Gun. I will share with you a presentation that will take you through uh, some of the key results from the assessment and also share some information on what the assessment is for those of you who are not familiar with it. Uh, and give you some key information that provides context to how the results, um, where the results come from and, and how we have been working. So uh, we're here today to uh, launch the official launch of the State of the Baltic Sea report. Uh, and uh, the State of the Baltic Sea report is the summer report or the culmination of the third holistic assessment. So we go through uh, what is HOLAS. Uh, we'll look at the results in brief and also look at uh, the next steps. As Rüdiger mentioned, it's kind of now that we know, what do we do kind of uh, questions. So about HOLAS, uh, as Rüdiger briefly mentioned, uh, the Baltic Sea Action Plan uh, is the instrument that Helcom uses to kind of set the scene for what measures are needed uh, in order to improve the status of the Baltic Sea. Now, in order to know whether or not these measures are actually working, we need to look at, can we see an effect uh, in the environment? So essentially, are the measures having the effect uh, that we're hoping for? And to do that, we need to track what the status of the environment is. So every six years, Helcom carries out holistic assessments. Uh, and they allow us to see whether or not the measures are working and where we might need to include new or um, amended measures. Now, the third holistic assessment, which is uh, the assessment that has led to the State of the Baltic Sea report, focuses on the years uh, 2016 to 2021. So essentially, it provides us a snapshot of what the status of the environment has been in this time period. And the State of the Baltic Sea report, which we're launching today, is a synthesis report where we have collated a large amount of information to give a holistic overview of what the status is. Uh, now, this is not the first holistic assessment uh, that Helcom has produced. And the idea is that we produce these with six year intervals so that we have a possibility to compare these snapshots um, between and amongst each other. So the initial assessment was done in 2010, then we did HOLAS 2 in 2018, and we're here now at the third holistic assessment. And the hope is that we will continue to do, do these also in the future, so that we get a longer and longer time series that we can use to guide decision making. And that brings us to this next question. So why do we actually do HOLAS? Why, why do we uh, need all of this information? Uh, and we use this, uh, to support decision makers and authorities uh, in their efforts to take decisions that benefit the Baltic Sea environment. So uh, the holistic assessment provides these decision makers with information on the status of the environment. Uh, it provides them with information on the spatial variation in status. So for example, it might be that even though the overall status in the Baltic um, would be poor, there might be areas where the status is good and others where it's much worse. And then we need to target the measures where they will do the most good, which is of course where the measures, uh, sorry, where the status is the worst. It also provides information on trends um, over time. So this looks at long-term trends, not just between the assessments, uh, which tells us that even though we might not be reaching Good and good status for a certain topic for this assessment, we can see that there's a positive trend that stretches far back that maybe uh, by the next assessment we would reach good status. Uh, then it informs decision makers on the distribution of pressures and human activities. So, what pressures uh, can we find where? How are they affecting the environment? And what human activities are causing these pressures? This is uh, highly helpful when you're trying to identify what kind of measures you would actually need to 
to put in place. And it allows us to follow up the effects of the measures and also um, the results of the assessment and, and the components of the assessments um, are made available so that uh, the countries can use them for uh, national reporting on the uh, Marine Strategy Framework Directive. Uh, so it's also kind of supporting the countries uh, directly through making all of this information available. Now, when we are taking these measures uh, and the decision makers kind of use this information uh, in their decision making processes, we need to account for uh, the whole management framework in order to understand where the different parts of HOLAS fits in. So where can you use what parts of the holistic assessments? And uh, for this, Helcom uses what we call the DAPSIM framework. It's a management framework that uh, tries to look at all the different parts uh, of the management cycle that then affects the status of the marine environment. So if we start at the top, you start with drivers. These drive changes in our activities. Uh, our activities cause pressures on the environment. Um, the pressures uh, affect the state, which then results in an impact, so a change in state. And then we take measures to try to affect this. Uh, and the measures primarily target the activities, the pressures, and the state, with uh, the measures targeting activities having clearly the, the highest kind of success rate because it's easier to target a pressure before it becomes a pressure while it's still an activity rather than try to fix it when it's already a, a problem. And this has worked as a guiding, uh, the kind of red thread through the whole holistic assessment. So for each topic in the holistic assessment, we've tried to address as many of these as possible. Uh, the information for these different components of the depth in framework varies quite a lot depending on the topic. But uh, this also indicates where we might need more information or do more research for the next assessment so that by the next assessment, we would have better information available. Now, Different uh, users of the holistic assessment need to use different uh, parts of or different components of the assessment. So it's set up so that you can access the information at whatever level makes the most sense to you. We provide data. Then on top of the data, we make the indicator evaluations. So we have a large number of indicators I will show you later. Uh, these indicator evaluation results go into indicator reports. The indicator reports are pulled together to do topical assessments, for example, biodiversity, hazardous substances, and so on. And these are pulled into thematic assessment reports where we group all of the themes uh, or all of the topics under one theme, for example, biodiversity. Uh, and all of this is pulled together into the state of the Baltic Sea report that we are here to launch today. And you can access this information at whatever level makes the most sense for you. Um, substantial process. <laughs> uh, a lot of the work goes into development. As you can see here, the development phase has run all the way from 2019. So just after the end of the uh, holistic uh, second holistic assessment. Uh, once the development is over, we start collecting the data that we know that we need in order to drive the assessment. Uh, and then the actual assessment phase starts. So the assessment phase is compar comparatively not very long, but very intense. It's been quite a, quite a ch challenging um, but rewarding 11 months of assessment. Uh, and it, it's staggered so that we kind of look at approving different components of the assessment as they become available uh, until we then hit this point where we have the final state of the Baltic Sea report ready. And then we work on the publication. So we publish these uh, as they become available, making them, um, yeah, making them available to decision makers as soon as they're ready, rather than waiting and publishing all of the material in one go. Now, um, Holas is quite a big uh, assessment. We have five thematic assessments. We have fifty nine indicators overall. We had almost a thousand experts involved in the work. Um, we have addressed in the last 11 months almost 3,000 comments <laughs> received on the various reports. Uh, and, and this also kind of helps to build a very robust assessment. Uh, we have 290 new map layers available in the Helcom Map and Data Service that are associated with the report. Uh, 
if you combine all of the material that has been produced, it makes for almost 3,500 pages. Uh, we have over 2 million data points that have been added and a substantial amount of caffeinated beverages that have been consumed by, both by the Secretariat and by all of the experts that have been working on this uh, for the last year or so. Now, that's kind of what HOLAS is, but let's see what HOLAS produced. So what are the actual results of the, uh, of the State of the Baltic Sea report? So as I mentioned, we have five themes of the assessment, uh, biodiversity, eutrophication, hazardous substances, marine litter, underwater noise, and non-indigenous species. So these all represent uh, some form of pollution, essentially. Spatial pressures and impacts, and economic and social analyses. And we will look at these in a bit more detail uh, here. Now, these are supported by 59 indicators uh, that are grouped according to the same um, kind of logic. And these also are uh, kind of grouped based on the segments in the uh, Baltic Sea Action Plan so that we can link the indicator reports to the Baltic Sea Action Plan. Here you can see how they are divided across the different um, thematic assessment reports. So each uh, each assessment report is uh, kind of substantiated or supported by a large number uh, of indicators that provide us more detailed information on which we then can draw conclusions on the state of, uh, of these different themes. So if we start by looking at biodiversity, on these maps you can see the results uh, for the various topics that are included in the biodiversity uh, assessments. These represent the integrated results, so where we have combined the various indicators to give us an overview of what the status is um, across the whole Baltic Sea for this given topic. And uh, as you can see, um, regrettably, there is quite a lot of red. Uh, the integrated assessment allows us to see both whether um, like the status is good or bad, essentially red or green, uh, but also tells us how far we are from target by providing a, a kind of three-step three scale of poor status and a, a two-step scale of good status. There are some, um, some topics for which you can see we have areas where, where we still have a good status or have achieved good status from having had poor status. Um, and uh, for many of these, even though the situation uh, looks to be quite dire, we can see um, positive trends or vaguely positive trends where measures have actually been implemented. But overall, the status for biodiversity is quite poor. And this is also the topic where a uh, change in status takes the longest to kind of appear when we put measures into place, because this is the end point of where the measures effect will be shown. So. For pelagic habitats, we do not have good status in any of the open sea subbasins. For benthic habitats, uh, we generally do not have good status in the southern Baltic, but there is good status in the open sea areas uh, in the northernmost subbasins, so where we have the least impact on seabed. For fish, only four out of the 15 assessed commercial stocks actually have good status, uh, so that's not a very high percentage. Uh, water birds overall do not generally have a good status. Here it varies a lot based on the functional groups, and you can find that information in the actual thematic assessment. Uh, for marine mammals, they do not exhibit good status uh, in any kind of uh, part of the Baltic Sea, um, but many of these are, are assessed at quite a high level because they are such mobile species. For food webs, we can see major changes in the abundance and biomass of species. Um, and these are driven then by human activities uh, and the pressures that stem from these. And we can see these changes across all of the food web. Now for hazardous substances, marine litter, underwater noise, and non-indigenous species, uh, we can see that the status for hazardous substances is quite poor. We have red in most areas. Um, because there are so many uh, hazardous substances that we assess, you can see that that um, the pie charts show the kind of proportion between the the different um, like status categories across across the different um, contaminants. For marine litter, uh, 
the vast majority of the Baltic Sea ends up in poor status. For this, we do not have an integrated assessment yet because um, there is not sufficient uh, indicators available to do proper integration. Uh, and there has been no kind of methodology developed for integration yet. So this is based on an indicator assessment, which means that it only tells you whether it's failing or achieving. We can see how far we are from target. Then we have underwater noise, uh, where you can see that there is significantly more uh, noise in the Southern Baltic than there is in the Northern Baltic. And for non-indigenous species, where you can see the overall introduction uh, rate all the way back from uh, 1860, actually. Uh, and uh, this should be zero in order for this, um, this indicator to reach its uh, target. So you can see that it failed because we do have a number of introductions in the last six years. So to summarize hazardous substances, the majority of the Baltic Sea is in bad or poor stasis. However, we can see decreasing trends in concentrations of several of the substances. So we can see that measures are working. Uh, for marine litter, uh, 11 out of the 16 subbasins do not have good status. And for underwater noise, um, the, it's below threshold for marine mammals, but it exceeds the threshold for masking, essentially what stops uh, or can, can interfere with uh, hunting for fish in nine out of the 17 assessment units. And for non-indigenous species, because there was introductions of non-indigenous species in the last six years, it is failing its threshold value. Then eutrophication, which is a major pressure in the Baltic. As you can see, uh, the vast majority of the different areas uh, have poor status, uh, but we are in either the poor or moderate uh, category for most of these. There are fewer areas that are in the, in the bad uh, category. So we can see that there's also, we're not there yet, but, but it's not as bad as it could be. So in summary, if you pull all of these together, uh, you can see the overall distribution of the different um, categories across the total area of the Baltic Sea. Uh, and uh, we have a little bit of green here, but the vast majority is red. Uh, and for some, some topics specifically, um, we have quite bad status. For example, harbor porpoise uh, and hazardous substances. Now we don't only look at the actual integrated assessments uh, that are driven by indicators. We also look at combining all of this information to get an overview of where we have what activities and what pressures. And that's what you get in the spatial distribution of pressure and impact assessment. So what you can see here uh, is the overall distribution across the Baltic Sea uh, of the different pressures that our activities are causing. Uh, and this gives us an indication of where we have, let's say, higher uh, need for measures um, versus where we maybe have uh, less high need for measures. Oh, there we go. We also look at economic and social anal analysis because it's highly important to understand the context um, of where these activities and, and pressures are stemming from and also um, what measures and how we should work with measures in order to achieve the most uh, benefit. So uh, with economic and social analysis, uh, we look at the use of marine waters. So essentially who is using it and for what, uh, and how much does that contribute to the regional economy? We look at cost of degradation. So essentially how much are the pressures uh, costing us uh, compared to if we had good status? Then we, for the first time in this assessment, also looks, look at ecosystem services. So how are ecosystem services distributed across the Baltic? Uh, how does that kind of tie into where we have um, pressures uh, and, and how those pressures are then, oh, sorry, impacting the, the various ecosystem services? So essentially the pressures are limiting our access to the services that we need as a society. We also look at cost benefit analyses um, and, and this kind of uh, looks also at, at the measures as in what is the, how much measures cost and how much benefit might we get out of them. 
And for the first time, we have tried to um, also explore the possibility of looking at drivers because the drivers that drive our activities are really key part of um, what define or what defines what pressures we have. And and uh, it could be a very um, key part of where we could put measures in place if we had a better understanding of the drivers behind our activities. Uh, this was done for only a subset of um, of topics and and only as a test in this assessment. Um, and and for these we used kind of activities that were considered to be strong proxies of drivers. And all of this can be found in the thematic assessment of economic and social analyses. Now, we know all of this. What do we do with it? What are the next steps? So some next steps are already outlined uh, in the various reports where there has been recommendations for what we could do with this material now that we have it. But there are also next steps that go far beyond that. So key takeaways that, that the reports are communicating is that the Baltic Sea is under increasing impacts from climate change and biodiversity degradation, both of which are the results of human activities. Uh, and especially biodiversity degradation has been catalyzed by eutrophication, pollution, land use and resource extraction. These are the main pressures that are affecting biodiversity. There is little to no improvement in the status of the Baltic Sea environment that occurred during the assessment period, even though we can see some changes in the trends. Uh, measures to reduce pressures are actually working um, where they have been implemented. So in some cases we have not maybe a measures uh, gap, but uh, an implementation gap. But where we have implemented them, they are working. Um, and uh, and it's foreseen that the the actions that are or measures that are included in the Baltic Sea Action Plan are highly relevant in order to actually achieve an improvement in status towards the next assessment. The effects of climate change are expected to increase in the future, which makes the need for measures even higher. Uh, and also that that we take a precautionary approach to making uh, or putting in place measures so that they are effective even under a uh, further changed climate. And uh, overall, we need to have true transformative change um, in all socioeconomic sectors that are relevant for the marine environment. Uh, and we need to have actions to stop current negative trends and like actively uh, protect and restore ecosystems to give them a chance to recover even when the the negative kind of effects are are halted. Uh, ecosystem knowledge and policies for the Baltic Sea environment have developed substantially within the past six years, partly because of the introduction of the Baltic Sea Action Plan, but also through a lot of other uh, activities. Uh, and this has, of course, contributed positively to uh, turning the trend. Uh, and overall, as an extension of these policies, implementing the updated Baltic Sea Action Plan and facilitating ecosystem-based management, where we manage our activities within the kind of uh, tolerance levels of the ecosystem, and in minimizing impacts from climate change, are all focal areas that uh, Helcom, but also all of the countries around the Baltic Sea, will need to focus on in the coming years. We've also been able to show that there is a very high cost of inaction. So even though measures are costly, the cost of inaction is even higher. Here you can see an overview of the distribution of uh, ecosystem services. So these are important services that, that uh, are relevant for us uh, as a society around the Baltic Sea. And here you can see the distribution of the pressures. You can see that there are some strong links of where we have a lot of ecosystem services and low pressures. Uh, and through this economic and social analysis, we have been able to identify, for example, that we lose over 9 billion euro a year solely for recreation um, through not achieving good status of the Baltic. So the cost of inaction is actually really high if you consider that this is only for one um, category of, of human activities or use of the marine environment. Uh, we can also see that 
the the measures are really working. So in the next steps, we should consider um, like strengthening measures where needed uh, or applying new measures where we don't have sufficient measures. Uh, here you can see the total amount of reduction in the introduction of nutrients into the Baltic Sea, um, both for phosphorus and for nitrogen. And you can see that there is a, a consistent reduction um, over the full time period, actually. Uh, also, when you count in uh, the last holistic assessment and uh, compared to the last holistic assessments, all of these reductions are now significant. So we don't no longer have no, no, no non-significant decreases of input. Now that we know, where do we go? Uh, and this will lead into the panel debate that we will have a little bit later. So very soon, actually, sorry to interfere, Yannicka, but time is running very short now. Yes, uh, this is my last slide. Oh, perfect. <laughs> uh, so national work in the HELCOM countries is at the core of implementing the Baltic Sea Action Plan. So uh, it is for the countries to really kind of ensure that they put the measures in place so that we can see improvement towards the next assessment. Uh, the third holistic assessment, so the state of the Baltic Sea report that we are here for today, uh, highlights the importance of measures to strengthen Baltic Sea biodiversity, uh, especially because we can see that there is a lot of, of kind of poor status in diversity. And that's, as I mentioned earlier, the end point of the measures. That's where we really want to see the change. Achieving a healthy Baltic Sea ecosystem requires measures that limit the extent and intensity of uh, human-induced pressures, but we also need these measures that, that actively protect and restore species where the degradation has already gone so far, that, that either recovery takes too long or it isn't possible to recover to previous state. Then there's an urgent need to equip the Baltic Sea ecosystem uh, with the capacity to withstand climate change in the future. And this essentially uh, translates into improving resilience. So resilience of the ecosystem is a key component if we're going to um, kind of withstand the effects of climate change. And now in Helcom, the next step is to incorporate all of this information, all of the results that we have uh, and the data behind it into these uh, ecosystem-based management frameworks and, and promote uh, sustainable use of the Baltic Sea. Thank you. That is all for me. Thank you, Janika. Um, I don't seem to be able to put on my video. Could please the technician do that? So I can still see, you can see me when, when I want to ask Janika some questions. Um, yes. Great, thank you, Sam. thanks a lot. This is such an immense work and such an overload of information. It I think it was really interesting that you left us with some keywords, you know, the cost of not doing anything, the importance of implementation, and just the fact that if we don't do anything, it's gonna get worse. But it's also really to the point that we need to do something rapidly. Was there something that really surprised you when you went through this work that was different from the previous ones? Was there something that you think, oh, this was, you know, an ex surprise maybe? Um, I think uh, part of what was surprising to me is, is that this assessment has, it's like improved from the last one, which is the way it's supposed to be. Like the more information we have, the better the assessment results should get, the more reliable let's say, the assessment results should get. And uh, one of the things that I think was quite surprising for me was that when we did the overall analysis of impact of different pressures uh, on the environment, um, we actually came out with that the ma major, like the main or highest pressure um, and high, most highly distributed pressure on the environment uh, isn't actually eutrophication uh, for this assessment, it's hazardous substances. Uh, uh, and what do you mean? How? But everybody talks about the fact that eutrophication is there, and you're still pointing it to the poor status. What What do you mean by that? Uh, well, eutrophication is still a major pressure in the Baltic, and these are really closely tied together. But uh, like hazardous substances in eutrophication, uh, both kind of have pole position. But uh, because of the improvements that have been made in the hazardous substances uh, assessment. 
we have a, a possibility to incorporate far more data than we had in the past, uh, which makes for a more reliable assessment. And that assessment then shows that hazardous substances are possibly a bigger pressure than we have assumed that it is in the past. So it's not so much that eutrophication uh, has become less important. It's that another pressure has has kind of taken uh, or share pole position now, uh, which indicates that maybe there, there is a need to look more closely at how do we put measures in place to handle hazardous substances, because more data and, and a better assessment has shown us that this is a bigger problem than maybe we have initially thought. Yeah, right. So you're, what you're actually saying is that uh, we learn more about hazardous substances. And by doing that, we realize how severe the problem is. Yes. I'm sure we'll get back to this during the panel. And you will also join us again for the Q&A session. So by that, thanks a lot again, Janika. And we will dive directly into the panel discussion based on what Janika has presented. So let me welcome my colleagues here at the panel. First, we have Dominic Patterson. You are the Executive Secretary of the OSPAR Commission. And as everybody here probably knows, OSPAR is the mechanism where 15 governments and EU corporates to protect the marine environment of the North East Atlantic. And OSPAR has also recently launched their own sort of POLAS uh, quality status report. But we'll hear more from Dominique about this. Uh, and then we have uh, Johanna Shellyan Fox, uh, also based here in Stockholm, like I am. You are the director of the WWF Baltic Eagle Region Program. And WWF, you are an active HELCOM observer organization. And you have a background in marine biology, I happen to know. So well, welcome to you as well. And then we have Lorne Mugsudeberg who is the Danish head of delegation in Helcom. You work as head of team in the Danish Ministry of Environment, Nature and Biodiversity Unit. And you also are trained in bi marine biologists. So please welcome Lona. And then last but not least, Michel Sponard. You are the deputy head of unit at the European Commission, DG Environment. And your responsibility include marine environment and water industry and including also Marine Strategy Framework Directive. So welcome to all of you, and we are so glad that you can join us here. And now we have uh, some minutes, uh, almost 25 minutes, to talk together and discuss your impressions and your reactions and your thoughts about what to do with this fantastic information in the, in the Hollis assessment. So let's start by just hearing a few words from all of you. How do you plan to use this, these results? Are there already things coming up in your mind? So maybe can I can start with you, Lorna, who represent the ministry in this perspective. How can you use the Holas report? Yes, thank you very much, Kun. Um, from a, a member state perspective, um, please allow me to first start by congratulating the Hillcom Secretariat and all the experts uh, and uh, the whole Helcom community that have uh, contributed to this report. Uh, this is indeed a very comprehensive and impressive report. So, and I also agree with uh, what uh, Yannick had presented so nicely that the report delivers a strong message to us all that the Baltic Sea is not in a healthy state. So I think that the results, they clearly indicate that we need to continue our joint work in, in Helcom and also highlights the need for taking action and implementing the Baltic Sea Action Plan. So that is, of course, uh, an important use of the report. But uh, we will also use the report uh, nationally. Um, all EU member states are obligated to assess the status of their national seas. And we will therefore use the HOLAS report as the backbone of our national uh, status report. So in this way, we will make sure that our national report are regionally coordinated. And uh, we see great benefits from this cooperation between uh, uh, amongst scientists and authorities from all the countries around the Baltic. So, um, so, yeah. so would you say that the report is you know, applicable for you both at a national and a regional level? Or is it mostly at your national level you can use it? No, definitely 
both uh, both uses. It will be of great value in Helcom, especially for communication purposes, the summary report. Um, but also nationally, we will use all the all levels of the Helcom report um, for our national status assessments. Thank you. And Dominique, uh, from your OSPA perspective, is this a similar report to your own sort of quality status report? Yeah, so thank you, Gun, and uh, good morning, everyone. Yeah, I think it's still good morning. It certainly is here. Um, <laughs> yes, yeah, I mean, there are, listening to, to Yannicka's um, excellent presentation, uh, I could see lots of similarities. Uh, as I think uh, it was mentioned previously, um, we published our uh, OSPAR quality status report, which is the equivalent of, of the Hollis Three report for OSPAR uh, a month or so ago. Um, and as you'd expect, messages are very similar. Uh, I think Rudiger's uh, introduction uh, at the outset, where where he explained that you know there is some good news, but overall the message is quite. Um, quite bad that the, the status, particularly of the biodiversity uh, status in the OSPAR region is, isn't good. And that is despite the fact that we have put in place measures, that a lot of those measures are working. I think we saw that again in the Hollis assessment. Uh, a lot of those uh, assessments are working, but it's still not having the impact that we would all like it to see. And ecosystem services, biodiversity is still suffering. Uh, so there is more to do. Um, I think what's really useful, and and again, as as Lona said, con congratulations to the to the Helcom team. Uh, I know from our perspective how much effort and work goes into producing these assessments, and this is a, another fantastic uh, product. Um, and I think what it shows is we already have a lot of uh, overlap between OSPAR and Helcom. We share contracting parties. Um, and we can learn from each other. So in terms of how we will use the, the Hollis 3 assessment is look to see uh, what, what Helcom have done. Uh, how can we learn from that uh, in OSPAR? Um, I've already been sort of going through the report and, and listening to Yannicka's presentation this morning, thinking, oh, that's a good idea. Maybe we should be doing that in OSPAR. Um, and it will be vice versa. We already have shared groups. We will learn from each other. Our experts sit in similar meetings. So, so for us, it's... Uh, uh, yeah, it's it's learning learning from each other, I think, and sharing those results, using both reports to put pressure on uh, our contracting parties to deliver the the measures that is clearly needed to protect both our uh, marine environments. You highlighted biodiversity. What about hazardous substances that Janika highlighted as a sort of an upcoming threat that yeah. was you know, more knowledge created the awareness that is there. Yeah, no, I, 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 I really noted that for a long time. Uh, I thought that uh, hazardous substances are probably having an, an impact that we're not fully understanding. Um, so it's really interesting to hear Yannicka sort of uh, say that that is one of the findings they found uh, in Hollows 3. I think in our assessment, we noted that um, we're very good at sort of banning things, so stopping things from getting into the marine environment. But with hazardous substances, uh, a lot of them tend to stay there. A lot of them tend to accumulate. Um, they get uh, resuspended when you have activities that disturb the seabed. Mm. And yeah. I think there is definitely something there in that cocktail of chemicals that ends up in the marine environment that we perhaps don't fully understand yet. You're right. Yeah, I'm sure we'll get back to sort of the possibility of knowing what you actually end up there with, you know, the industry's uh, openness, etc. But we'll probably get there. Johanna, please, let me turn to you. You represent here sort of the NGO perspective. What are your views on the Hollis report? How can you use it within your sector? Thank you, Gun, and good morning all. And I would like to just add what we've heard previous speakers talk about, the, to commend the, the Hillcom Secretariat and everyone who's been part of producing this report. It's fantastic to have this time series of the state of the Baltic Sea. And from an NGO or environmental organization perspective, from WWF's perspective, I think one of the main take homes from this, from this report is what we've heard today. We measures work when they are implemented. And I think this is a, 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 a thing that 
us as we are observers to Helcom, um, we, we uh, act as watchdogs for policy implementation. That's probably how I see that we can use this report is to put pressure on contracting parties to start implementing measures. They work, but they need to be implemented. And um, we also know from the implementation of the previous Baltic Sea Action Plan that only 25% of national measures were implemented. So I think it, it's also one of those, it, it's not surprising that Hollis 3 comes out showing this way where we haven't been implementing measures where we should have. So that's how I see it from our, our perspective is that we, we will use it to put pressure on contracting parties. We can use it for communication, but also informing our own work where we are in the field, uh, restoring uh, coastal areas of the Baltic Sea, but really, uh, ensuring that we act where it can have uh, impact. So what you're saying is that it can be used as a leverage for action also. Was that the same experience from the previous Hollis's? You've probably been involved with that as well. Uh, absolutely. We have used the previous Hollis, uh, Hollis for the same purposes. I think what, what this one really shows and what I like is that it's very concrete of the cost of inaction. Uh, it, the cost of ecosystem services that are currently uh, for free. Mm. Uh, I think it's uh, it says in the report that's 10.5 billion uh, euros per year is what we get from free service of sequestering nutrients by underwater plants and algae. That mm. is something if we continue on the path of, of degraded ecosystem, that's a service that we lose. Um, so the cost of inaction is really high and we need to really start acting now and putting more measures in place. Yeah, thanks. We'll get back to action, I'm sure. Um, Michel, from the European Commission perspective, how can this be useful for you? What do you plan to do with it from your perspective? Well, thank you and good morning to everybody. I, I would like to uh, also really praise this report for us. It's it's a kind of model. Uh, it's really a fantastic product, and I think that there are a lot of things that we can, you know, learn from this report. Uh, definitely, you know, we we are working uh, at European level on uh, on four C's, in fact, in the European uh, context, and I think we have to to learn from this report uh, also in the other context. I had the chance to represent the European Union before in OSPAR, and now I am representing the European Union in Elcom, and for me, it's a, it's a fantastic experience, you know, to be on both sides. But I think that, you know, probably the margin of uh, progress is uh, even um, uh, higher in the Mediterranean seas, uh, and not to say in the Black Sea, where the situation is uh, also very complex. Complicated. So I think this type of report and uh, OSPAR is doing something similar is really an example for the rest of the world, I would say, you know, because it's unique to have this kind of, uh, you know, integrated assessment uh, between different countries sharing the same sea. So there is a lot to be learned from that, not only at European level, but at worldwide level. And I really would like to praise this this product because I think it's a, it's a model for, uh, for a lot of uh, of other uh, entities. For us, uh, it's absolutely clear that this report will also contribute to the official reporting under the Marine Strategy Framework Directive. It was mentioned by loan, but it's a, it's a really good product because it helps, you know, also to report under the uh, Marine Strategy Framework Directive. It will contribute also to the state of the environment, which is done by the European uh, Agency, Environmental Agency in Copenhagen. So. There are a lot of things that uh, will be extracted from this report in the official uh, European reporting. But all in all, the most important to me is that we have a product which is, you know, giving facts. And that's really important, you know, for policy development in the future. We need these facts. We need this data. We need information coming from the field uh, so that we can really think about our priorities, but also we uh, see what has worked and not worked in our policies. So would you say that there are things missing? I mean, have, maybe it's a bit premature to ask this question because I think we need more time to dive into the report. But at this glance, have, are you thinking about things that you've been thinking, oh, we need to know this more to get this action that you're asking for? But probably um, it will come a little bit later, but I, I understand that, you know, um, the, the first thing I would like to say is that it's very comprehensive already, you know. 
Now I am a policymaker. I'm involved in the negotiation of several directives, and recently I'm deeply involved in the negotiation on the urban wastewater treatment directive, for instance. And I can see that uh, a lot of information coming from this report can be used because some mm -hmm. member states are pushing for more, uh, you know, higher standard on nitrogen and phosphorus. Uh, to other are not, you know, and they are sharing the same sea, you know, in the Baltic Sea. And you know, you see the the situation on eutrophication. I think that they are clear, you know. Um, clear criteria and clear facts, you know, pushing for more ambitions for different concrete actions, which are also taken at European level. Yeah, right. It's interesting that you that sort of link them to the ongoing negotiations, because that, of course, brings to my mind the question, would you say that the countries are acting similar within the health comparison and also at other negotiation tables? Of course, you would like to see the same sort of commitment within different seats. Um, not exactly, but uh, I don't want to uh, mention names or to, no, you know, I think the that. situation of each country around the Baltic Sea is different. I mean, uh, we have to take into account the fact that, uh, you know, possi the possibilities of investments are different and, uh, you know, and the rhythm of this investment might be different as well. But I think that there is a common understanding uh, amongst the Baltic countries that there is uh, a need to work on eutrophication and that urban wastewater treatment directive is one of the means to go there. But probably in some countries, agriculture has become the first, uh, you know, uh, source of uh, nitrogen and phosphorus, and in other, it's still urban wastewater. So the situation right. might be different from one country to another, which could justify, uh, you know, uh, a different approach. Huh? Oh, for so sure, so that yes. That's the European situation, for sure, yes. So, Lorna, back to you. Um, are there things missing from your perspective, from a national perspective, things that you would have liked to see? And I'm, um, you know, thinking a bit ahead to the next assessment. I'm sure Helcom Office don't want to talk about this right now, but you know, let's still look a bit forward. Well, uh, definitely Holas three is an improvement uh, compared to Holas uh, two and one. But of course, we can so, still. So, how, get... how, from, from what perspective, more precisely, what is the thing that stands out from your perspective? Well, we have improved the number of indicators, threshold values, making it further quantified, these assessments. Mm -hmm. the assessment and that makes it tools. more useful for you then as well? Well, it, it makes it more useful, it makes it more solid. Mm -hmm. uh, we have expanded the number of indicators. So there are a lot of improvements that we have seen. Um, but still, of course, we can get better. For some topics, we can still see that fully operational indicators are still missing. Uh, so I would, of course, like to see that further improve towards the, the next haulers as I expect we will be making. Um, I also noticed that, uh, well, I think Helcom is quite far advanced regarding the potential cumulative impacts using the, the SPEAR tool. But uh, from a policy point of view, it could also be interesting to dive further into what is the or what are the most important pressures uh, on each of the biodiversity components? I noticed that uh, that OSPA did some work on these aspects that looks very interesting. Oh, that links um, to you, Dominic. So please, uh, yeah. from your comment on that. Uh, yeah, th th thank you, Lona, uh, for highlighting that. Yeah, I, I was actually looking at the 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 Helcom work on the, the SPIA, the I think the spatial. Uh, was it spatial distribution pressures and impact and thinking how interesting that looked but but as Lona said yeah we we spent uh, quite a bit of time trying to do a better assessment of cumulative impacts um, in the OSPAR region we produced something called uh, Sankey diagrams uh, which uh, using that we call it the, the DAPSIR model I think Helcom called it the DAPSIM model it's the same thing it looks at drivers activities pressures, uh, state impacts, and then we call it response, but Helcom called it uh, measures. Um, we took that model and we try and assess the which of those drivers, which of those activities at the sort of kind of uh, left-hand side of the model are having the biggest impact on state and then what the sort of impact it, it is and, and what those responses are. Um, it's We would be the first to admit it's still work in progress, but 
as Nona said, understanding what are the most important drivers and activities in terms of their impact on state um, is really important so that you can then focus your measures on those drivers and impacts. Um, uh, yeah, we've in our assessment, we sort of shown the sort of progress we've made on that, but it's, it's really tricky stuff. I think we shouldn't underestimate how complicated the marine environment is and understanding those relationships between drivers, pressures, going back to that kind of what is the effect of hazardous substances, that cocktail of uh, chemicals in the sea and how that's impacting on biodiversity is, is really tricky stuff. And a lot of the science is at the cutting edge uh, of, of, of marine science. So even if it's uh, sort of, as you said, a work in progress, are there things that you can say about drivers? What would, what did you see? Were the things sticking out that was interesting? Uh, I, as I said, I wouldn't, and we made it clear in the report, I think it's probably too early to sort of okay. be able to rely on those those uh, Sankey diagrams to, to really be definitive. Um, mm -hmm. But, you know, there are obvious pressures on the marine environment, uh, human activities. Fishing pressure is, is, a, is a, certainly in the in the OSPAR region uh, or in some of our regions. It is uh, is a big pressure. Uh, nutrients, climate change uh, is, is a big. But, right. So it's all the common ones, really. Yeah. Yeah. What about the NGO sector? That, again, then going back to you, Johanna. Um, for the next assessment, I mean, you were definitely stressing implementation for sure. Would you, can I be blunt and say that maybe we know enough and we don't do enough? Is that what you're saying? Yes. Yeah, I think so. That's exactly what I'm saying. I think, yes, while while for the next assessment that aspects of the report and the methodology can be improved, as we just heard from Lorna and from Don Dominic, However, the most important thing is to actually implement measures. And that's what I would like to see in the next report is that we see even more concrete measures that have uh, uh, given proper results in the Baltic Sea itself, that we actually are bending this curve, the negative uh, trajectory of the state of the Baltic Sea. That's what I'd like to see. And, and linked to that, I think that it's really important, and this is also mentioned in the report, that we don't use the lack of knowledge or that we don't have specific exact knowledge on what exact pressure is impacting what exact ecosystem component. That cannot be used as a hinder or as an argument for an action. We must really focus on measures that we know are working. We know that by uh, implementing marine protected areas, uh, using um, no-take zones can restore uh, local fish populations. We know that reducing nutrient runoff by better agricultural practices, by better water retention measures on land has an, a positive impact on eutrophication. We need to scale up these measures. Those measures that we do in work, we need to start scaling that up. So I would like to see a report where the next one shows that we have scaled up the measures and that is starting to show an impact. So are you saying what somebody else said here in the panel in the next report, even link it even further to policy issues ongoing? Is that what you're asking for? Or could that be a complementary thing? Absolutely, I think that could be a complementary thing. Um, um, and linking it to, I think for the, for the next report, if it is to be informative, also looking at what measures should be put in the short term, what can have the short term positive impacts on the environment and what are the measures that we need to put in place, but that take a little bit longer time to see impacts. It is in the report, but it can even be more concretely um, communicated. Okay, great. Uh, we will very soon move in to input, uh, take some questions from the uh, Q&A, and I'm just encouraging everybody who's listening. Now we have 248 participants, so please um, send in lots of questions, and they will be handled by the people and brought forward to me here in the chat, and I'll put them to the whole panel, including also Janika and Rüdiger, of course. So finally, before we move into this, uh, is there like one, two, three words that you would like to sort of hand over to Helcom for the next process with Hall's assessment four, I suppose then, six years from now? Dominic, what would you like to see? Uh, uh, thanks, thanks, good. Um, yeah, I, I was just thinking what I could say. Um, I wanted to sort of really follow up on what Joanna was saying uh, about, um, we kind of know what the problems are, 
we just need to put the measures in place I say just it's <laughs> it's not just I know it's difficult but I think we do know enough uh, about what the the main um, pressures are the main activities are um we, we need to get better at identifying the right measures that allow for sustainable use but at the same time protecting the marine environment protecting the eco ecosystem services that the marine environment provides so on a sort of slightly more positive note then i think i think both reports do show that measures can work so that's really encouraging um we need to find the right measures we need to apply them over a larger geographical area we need to make sure that they're implemented um and i think just to reflect that in ospar some of the conversations we've been having on the back of the assessment is actually we're pretty good at assessment we do it well we should now be moving more of our attention and focus on implementation of measures and identifying new measures so so i think that's a, a positive sort of message coming out of these reports is that yep we i think yannick has said it we kind of it wasn't a surprise the results coming out of this we know what the problems are right. let's try and work on uh, effectiveness and implementation of measures uh, some of the existing ones probably need longer to take effect but we also need to identify new ones um, and make sure they're implemented. Yep. Right. Thank you, uh, Lorna, from your perspective. Some final standoff to Helcom. Well, I think I already gave a few inputs regarding yes. what could be uh, improved. Um, a, a last few remarks. Um, well, if we need to improve our knowledge on a few issues, it could be cumulative impacts in order to improve the ecosystem-based approach. Uh, we were talking about the cost of inaction. Could also be very interesting to know more about the abilities of a healthy ecosystem to store uh, carbon. Mm -hmm. uh, but with that being said, uh, that is uh, not an excuse for, a, for inaction. So let's continue with the implementation of the Baltic Sea Action Plan and uh, as these uh, status assessment will also be the backbones of the national status assessments. The HOLOS report will also influence the measures that we will initiate nationally. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And Michel? Um, well, you know, I, I think I have a, a lot of uh, wish for the future and particularly as policymaker, you know, uh, to have more information on what has worked and not worked in the measure, you know. Uh, mm -hmm. clear identification of the future challenge. I, I mean, climate change was mentioned, but at the end, you know, we have to translate that into measure that could be taken and at the right level, you know, that's also another, uh, pos you know, difficulties. But I see other challenge like the development of wind farming, you know, which, which could really be, you know, a huge uh, uh, issue in the future and that we have to anticipate in a sense so that we don't have only uh, with all last three a fantastic picture of what is the situation now and its evolution in the past, but also some perspective for the future, but also an identification, but it was already mentioned by Dominique and by Joanna, you know, an identification of where we have to, to place our priorities in terms of cost and benefits, you know, what are the measures which will deliver the most important effects. Having that said, I know that it's fantastically complicated that, you know, the evaluation is really difficult of the different tools. It takes a lot of time because we are doing that at Europe and level, uh, you know, when we are reviewing some directive, we are forced to make an, evalu an evaluation of these directives and I know that it, it could take a lot of time. So I think that uh, for all us, uh, probably we have to focus on key priorities and keep really the, the um, factual aspect as really important. I mean, this report must remain something scientifically uh, credible, you know, and uh, really very solid uh, in terms of uh, a collection of data and scientific assessment. That's really important. But, you know, this link with uh, uh, policy measure is also important and Otherwise, this, this report will remain, uh, you know, only a picture of the situation, you know. So all the two aspects are important uh, for the future uh, for us, for me. Thank, Thank you. you. And last, Johanna, you already stressed the implementation aspects. Anything else that you'd like to send off? 
Well, I, I, I will sound like a, a broken record that I will say implementation again, but I would really like to stress, I mean, from a Hellcom perspective, regional collaboration is is really important what these reports do show, uh, but we also need measures at a national level, but linked to what, what Michelle uh, spoke about and, and what we've heard before. Oh dear, we're losing her. Ah, we had a technical problem. We've been lucky so far. Ah, well, now you're back, Johanna. We just oh, I'm back. Sorry, yes. that was that was that was the stop of what I said there at the end. Yeah. That was perfect. We got it. Thank you very much. Thanks so far, uh, the panel, and thanks a lot for giving us strong messages and your very interesting views. You will still hang on, but let's move in some question to take some questions now, and we will also then welcome Janika back and also Rüdiger. And I'll just dive directly into questions. And I'll start off with a question, who's actually from a colleague of mine at Stockholm University here, um, which reads the following. How are nutrient loads including in the pressure index? And uh, Benbel says that she's a bit surprised to see that the pressure index is low around major river mouths. I suppose this goes to Yannicka then, if it's possible to answer. Yes, thank you. Uh, so the nutrient loads are included through the layer, uh, the spatial layer that we have from for eutrophication. So it's essentially the integrated uh, assessment results from the eutrophication assessment that is included in the in the sp uh, spatial pressure and impact assessment. Uh, so that's why you can't see uh, direct ef effects, for example, around the, the river mouths because the eutrophication layer is uh, integrated to the sub-basin level. So you get the the effect is distributed across the whole sub-basin where that river mouth kind of empties into. Uh, this is part uh, of what Lone mentioned that we could do further improvements on the on the spatial pressure and impact and uh, assessment so that we would get higher levels of precision uh, within that by using uh, more and, and more precise uh, data layers as the input. Uh, but it requires further development of the tool as well in order to be able to do that. And it's something that we are actually already uh, working on towards the next assessment uh, because these analyses aren't used only for HOLAS. Uh, in Helcom, they're also used for other uh, or have other use cases, for example, for for uh, marine spatial planning and so on, especially the activity layers. So, so, it's, so you're you're more or less saying that it's a question of data quality and methods, and not a fact of neglecting that there is a high level of nutrient limits. Yeah, so, and in this case, mostly methods because we do have pretty good data on the nutrient oh. inputs. It's more of a how do we incorporate that data in in the SPIA model. Um, like more precise data on the nutrient inputs can be found both in the thematic assessments for eutrophication and in the PLC, the pollution load compilation report, which is uh, for which we also have quite a recent um, publication. Right. Thank you. And I think that this next question also must be directed to you, Janneke. Um There was a talk about minimizing the climate change impact on the environment. And the question is, if you could please elaborate, what that, does this mean? Or can you give some examples what you were thinking and writing about when you talked about minimizing? Yeah, so uh, I, I briefly touched on this right at the end of my presentation, but uh, we're not we're not going for some kind of like geoengineering solution here, but it's more about uh, enhancing the resilience of the ecosystem. So we have pressures that, are easier to manage uh, on a regional level or on a local level, and those which are not. And climate change is one of those which aren't easy to manage <laughs> on a regional level. So if we put more focus on managing our activities and the pressures that they cause, where we can actually affect them, then that kind of releases more resilience in the ecosystem to then take on um, like pressures that we can't manage, like climate change. So if we remove activities that are causing pressures, then that en enables the ecosystem to have more resilience against other pressures. Because of course, um, at any given moment, the Baltic Sea ecosystem system experiences a multitude of pressures. So if we remove some of those, 
then hopefully that will help improve resilience against climate change as well. So that that's kind of um, what we were hinting at, and that this can be done both by removing activities specifically or removing pressures, but also possibly by by supporting um, the ecosystem through restoration. And this could be active restoration, where we actually go in and, and actively help, if you will, the ecosystem uh, to recover. But it could also be passive restoration, where essentially we just yeah remove as many pressures as possible and then let the ecosystem recover. OK. Thank you. And then can there's I, a question. Please, sorry, could I just come in on that one? Of course. Yeah, thank of course. you. Yeah, no, I just wanted to um, support Yannicka on that because we've, as you'd expect, we've had a very similar conversation in, in OSPAR. OSPAR doesn't have a mandate to tackle sort of emissions reductions, things like that. And there's lots of policies and you know countries are, uh, are dealing with that. But as Yannicka says, we we have we, we in Ospar as well, we've got a much bigger sort of focus on climate change than we used to have. We now have a new climate change and ocean acidification working group we've got our most sort of uh sort of comprehensive assessment of climate change and ocean acidification in in our qsr this time around um and it's looking at how we can improve the the resilience of our marine environments how can we support those habitats to deal with the inevitable pressures that climate change will bring so uh yeah i just yeah as i said i just wanted to show that we are joined up on these things across sort of regions and we have similar approaches and i think that's really important because it sends the, the message so we can use our evidence reports to go away to other policy colleagues sort of that are dealing with climate change to show the impacts of climate change and then we can do what we can to try and uh, uh, improve the resilience of the marine environment to those impacts as well Thank you. This links nicely to the next question, which is put to all of you panelists. Uh, what are the most important measures to implement now? Who wants to go first? Lorna, what will be most important from your perspective? Well, from my perspective, I would like to highlight what I see as, well, the crown jewel of the Hillcom work and that is the nutrient reduction scheme. Um, the entire Baltic Sea continues to suffer from too many nutrients. Good progress has been achieved uh, in relation to reduce our nutrient inputs, but in some areas, the reductions have uh, stagnated or even increased. So I think we should increase our efforts in order to reach the maximum of allowable inputs and the national input ceilings. Okay, thank you. And Johanna? Thank you. Um, I, I'm going to take a, a step back from the actual measure here and say that we need to ensure that there's a funding available for the measures that we need to see, whether it is implementing marine protected areas or restoring coastal coastal areas or restoring uh, areas on land or what we heard Lorna say, the, uh, ensuring that we meet up the nutrient reduction scheme. Um, we need funding for this. It, okay. it comes at a cost and a lot of funding linked to the Baltic Sea, whether it's EU related, national funding and so on, often calls for innovation. And oh, here we... The blue to pace principle? Um, if that one was fully implemented, then definitely that could work. But we need funding. There needs to be money uh, available for this and not just looking at innovative solutions, but actually just scaling up what we know works. OK, so what about, uh, Michelle, your perspective then on the most important measures to implement now? I, I just want to comment on what Janet just said. You know, in the review of the Urban Wastewater Treatment Directive, we are trying to include the polluter space principle. Well, in fact, I think it will pass, but it's difficult. Uh, so, uh, you know, we, we are trying to push uh, standards for pharmaceuticals and cosmetics, you know, in the uh, wastewater for micropollutants, because they are representing the most important micropollutant font in, in urban wastewater. And so the intention is to make uh, industry pay for this additional treatment, which is required in the uh, wastewater treatment plants. And that's uh, very complicated, but I think that we have, it's an example of uh, additional funding that we should try to uh, further explore because if we are always waiting for you know public funding uh, progress are slow and uh, could take time and there is no 
this sense of responsibility, be, uh, you know, between industry and uh, or the use of some products and the, their impact on the environment. So I think that new ways of funding should be explored. For the rest, I think that um, I agree with this idea that we need to implement, uh, you know, better what we have already decided, you know, and that's and pay more attention to that. I mean, I have some example. The biodiversity strategy includes the 30 percent of protection of uh, our seas. That should be put in place with a strict protection of part of it, uh, at least of 10%. We have, we are taking measure also uh, on agriculture, and there was a question on the common agricultural policy. Uh, all that, the intention are there, but what is lacking is really the actual implementation, the concrete implementation, and I think that's on eutrophication. Urban wastewater treatment will follow and uh, efforts will be done, and that's easy to monitor and to implement in a sense, or at least to track, you know, whether on agriculture, the efforts are more complex because it's individual entities and it's very complex. And, and, and also, I mean, it's a, a sector which is more uh, difficult. On okay. hazardous waste, I think that uh, we, we are working on reach, but also under the review of the industrial emission directive. All that needs to be implemented. That's that's probably my main message, so, you know. And so so many things is... that we've already decided that needs to go there. What about the, from the OSPA perspective, which would be the most important one to start off with? I think Rudiger had his hand up, actually. Oh, and, sorry, I didn't see that. Yeah. Sorry. So yeah, we'll, I'll we'll let Rudiger go first. A few words, a few moments. No, no worries, um, Dominic. You've been asked a question. Go ahead. I'd, I'd like to make a more general statement, actually. So um, please, go ahead. Take the floor. I was hoping I could pass the buck there, really. Um, no, thank you. No, I would, I would, uh, I would, I wouldn't want to pick a favourite measure. Uh, the most important measure. I think I, I hinted at what I thought were some of the, the, the yes, biggest sir. impacts in um, in our area, at least in, in the Northeast Atlantic. We have a very diverse uh, set of five regions from the Arctic to the wider Atlantic yes, going sir. out into areas beyond national jurisdiction. So the, the measures and what's needed to protect those very different areas and of course the the north sea which is a very busy uh, sea but the measures needed in each of those regions is, is different all right so now there, so there, there are some adaptation. important pressures fishing always comes up in our, in our discussions as well as most in, uh, important well, uh, measures the lack of measures in some of our regions completely is is another uh, key factor so um yeah, I find it hard to sort of sort of say which one is the most most important. Um, and if I can just just say in terms of funding, um, absolutely right, Joanna, funding is is crucial to this. And Michelle is right that funding is available from the European Union. We used it uh, to a great extent in our QSR in terms of being able to do better assessments. I would just make a plea that making it easier to access that funding um, is uh, is crucial to us. The amount of resource and effort it takes to secure uh, project funding is quite significant for a, for a small secretariat. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Rudiger, please. Yes, thank you. And that's what I get for ceding the floor to Dominic, because now basically I can only echo what he said. Um, you asked what is the most important um, of these measures to be implemented. Um, I'm always reluctant to answer that question. I mean, clearly some things take priority, some things are more urgent than others, but we have adopted an action plan containing 199 actions. And that's because we need 199 actions to be implemented. Now we have different, different timelines for some of them. Some, some of them will have to be implemented sooner than others. But the main point I'd like to make is that we need to implement all of them. We did not manage to implement um, all of them in the uh, 2007 action plan. Um, and I think we need to improve on that. So if there's 199 actions, let's work to implement 199 actions. And yes, Dominic said that, Johanna said that, and I agree. There's a huge price tag to that, um, but I think it's a price we have to pay because the price of an action is just so much higher in the long run. Thank you. Um, I'd like to follow up with the question that also is addressed to all of you, and it links to what we've just been talking about, the most important action, but this brings us back to national politics. And the question is, what is your advice for better implementation in national politics? Because as this person writes, it is a main key for something to happen. Dominic, please continue. Is there, you talk about this all the time, of course. <laughs> Uh, yeah, I, I, well, as as a as a secretariat to an international body, it's, I, I need to be quite careful uh, yeah. in terms of um, what I say here. Uh, I, I think what I would say is I think that 
uh, Helcom, OSPAR, Barcelona Convention, um, regional sea conventions provide a really uh, good platform for sharing common issues across common sea areas. And that, in my experience, enables um, consensus to be built around what those problems are. It enables people to be more open about what the sort of uh, politics maybe that are going on and to understand each other's um, national situations to come up with solutions that could be sort of acceptable to a whole range of countries. Um, and that can, that consensus building approach, I think can sometimes enable you to make more progress than if you're only dealing with something at a national level. Um, right. So I, I think just a, a plug for regional cooperation and, and the power that can bring to help influence uh, uh, decisions at a national level, at, at a political level. I think right. if, if, if all your neighbours are doing something, it's much more difficult for you not to do something. So bringing exactly, that, yeah. that collective weight. Coming together and talking about it and putting leverage and pressure yeah. on the national level. Uh, Lorna, from your perspective then, if you're going into national politics. Yes, well, I agree very much with what was said by Dominic. Um, and I think that the, this Hillcom report also provides very clear communication for decision makers. Thank you. And Michelle? Well, I'm, we are working at, uh, on European policies, and I can tell you that, uh, you know, reports coming from uh, the, the regional seas convention are, are fundamental for us for driving European policies where they are needed. I was mentioning, you know, REACH, for instance, we, we, which is hazardous substance and restriction of hazardous substance in products. That is really a complement, and that should act in synergy if these products and these hazardous substances are found in the seas, like it is shown on our last tree. It's a clear signal for us to ban some product or to restrict the use of some product uh, at source. And there, the European Union has a clear added value. But I was also thinking on marine litter. You know, uh, we we have made a directive on single-use plastic. You know, to remove from the market some items which are found in the seas. But the, the data are coming from the the, the regional seas convention. So. Uh, Myself and we, our team are really working to ensure that synergies are made between the European policies and the, the, what is found in the uh, Regional Seas Convention, because the Regional Seas Convention are providing us the fundamental data to, to justify European action uh, you know, when, it's, when it's required. So probably the challenge is also to identify what measure is to be taken at what level. Some measures are to be taken at local level, other at regional level, other at national, and other at European level. That's another challenge. Thank you. And Johanna. Thank you. Um, I hope that, that this report can be a wake up call and I hope that uh, the state of the Baltic Sea becomes more of a higher pol political priority nationally uh, in the countries around the Baltic Sea. And that um, what we heard from, from Dominic, regional cooperation is really important. The Baltic Sea doesn't see any borders. So it's only together that we can solve it. And whether it is to ensure that we do not look at a national best interests in forming decisions on, on fisheries quotas or, or when we look at nutrient uh, reduction targets, but really looking at the Baltic Sea as a whole because that impacts people around the Baltic Sea. Another one of these uh, figures from the report is that reaching good environmental status can provide 5.6 billion euros a year in benefits, recreational benefits to people around the Baltic Sea. So, so that's something that if we work together, then um, uh, that can benefit net people in each of our countries. So hence, um, uh, making it a priority, but also ensure that we do co collaborate across the Baltic Sea, even more Thank so you. than before. And then we have a question regarding uh, public awareness, engagement and understanding of Hall as three. Who would like to comment on this? Uh, how can we improve the public awareness around these issues? What does Helcom do for themselves? Janneke or Rüdiger? Yeah, maybe I can start here and Rüdiger can <laughs> pick up. Uh, well, one of the things that we're doing is this webinar. Uh, so we're trying to uh, really kind of communicate this to a broader public. 
because this is something that is relevant, uh, as we can see also for, with some of the questions that are coming in, that it's not just uh, politically important, it's also uh, important for many of the like sectors that use the Baltic Sea um, in relation to um, corporate uh, responsibility and, and ensuring limiting impact, because uh, I mean, nobody wants to be, nobody wants to have a negative impact on the environment. So uh, it, the communication of the HOLAS results should stretch far beyond uh, kind of the, the standard um, audience that we have in Helcom. Uh, we would like to reach the general public because this is highly relevant for them. Uh, the Baltic Sea is their sea as much as it is our sea, uh, but also um, yeah, the sectors that use the Baltic Sea and have an impact on it to better understand or better communicate uh, the relationship between the activities that we take or that we do and the pressures that they cause and what is the consequence of these pressures. Uh, because this kind of chain of information um, is also a highly valuable communications tool because it explains how you fit into the general status of the marine environment. We're uh, looking at some innovative uh, approaches also for communicating the state of the Baltic Sea, but these are still uh, being considered and, and hopefully within a year we will have uh, additional tools that we could use to communicate to a broader audience than we have in the past. Thanks a lot. Uh, I think we maybe have, if, if there's a short answer, we have time for one more question, then we will have to wrap up. Time is running really. Uh, there's a question coming in asking um, if you, with considering the assessment, could you please point out some areas where regional cooperation should be strengthened in particular? Is that possible? You know, anybody who would like to sort of see a certain issue uh, being more regionally cooperated? Feel free to just take the floor. I might jump, jump in, Gun. Yeah, please, please do. Mm -hmm. I think that something that was brought up by Michelle and what on a pressure that or could be a pressure that's sort of in, in the future, and that's around offshore renewable energy. Um, I think it's really important to ensure um, proper cooperation across the Baltic Sea countries when trying to meet these energy targets so that offshore renewable energy expansion does not become this added pressure to the Baltic Sea, but can work in rather in its favor. But in that case, we have to work across countries because um, otherwise, um, like I said previously, the Baltic Sea doesn't see any borders. So neither should we in trying to plan offshore renewable energy that can enhance biodiversity rather than having a negative impact. Yes, thank you. Uh, Janneke, you get the final word. Yes, uh, I think a similar topic to what Johanna brought up is protection efforts, because all of the countries are putting efforts into protecting the marine environment and, and specifically like marine protected areas of different types. Um, but because these protection efforts have historically been handled by each country individually, even though they make part of a greater puzzle where all of the, the protected areas essentially could be supporting each other, then this is an area where I think there is quite a lot of uh, like positive progress that could be made to really make sure that we get um, we get the benefits out of the protection that we are hoping for. And because a lot of these areas are already put in place. So it, it requires quite minimal efforts to, to kind of possibly get quite a lot of gain out of the already established areas. And all the countries are working towards reaching the 30% protected areas or 30% protection for the whole Baltic by 2030. It means that for many of the countries, significant expansions are planned within the next uh, coming years. So figuring out how to best place those new areas so that they get benefit, not just for their own uh, protected areas, but for the protected area network in the Baltic is really of key importance. Uh, yeah. It can really enhance what we could get out of the efforts that have already been put in place. Right. Thank you. 
Thank you ever so much. And thank you all to all you who sent in questions and thanks for participating. And thanks, a warm thank to all you panelists. I will now give the word, word to Rüdiger for a wrapping up of this webinar. Please, Rüdiger. Thank you, Gun. Thank you very much. And um, I actually think this webinar is a bit too short because there are so many things I would have liked to say and wasn't allowed to say today, but that's why I'm especially happy that we have such a great panel which said most of what I wanted to say for me. So thanks to the panelists um, and thanks to all of you for participating. Um, I'll be brief. Um, I think it's clear that we have a consensus around this table and probably also around the entire virtual table as to the usefulness of the information we can glean from this report and the usefulness of the information um, that is contained in this report. Um, what I find encouraging, though, is the conclusion we draw from that, because, of course, if you have a lot of information, you can fall into a number of traps. One is to engage in continuous navel gazing and try to glean more and more information, provide, create, provide, generate more and more information and basically um, revolve around yourself. That would be disastrous, of course, in our case. And then um, I was reminded those uh, of, of you who know me well know that I'm an avid reader of comics of all sorts. And one of my favorite comic characters is Calvin from Calvin and Hobbes. And I was reminded today when Yannicka said that we realize now that eutrophication is not perhaps anymore the primary pressure, but we actually know that hazardous substances have at least, um, uh, well, basically are, are now um, uh, joining um, eutrophication in, in the pole position. We're gaining more and more information. And I know that Calvin, and I, I Googled this because I remembered approximately what he said. He says, you realize that nothing is as clear and simple as it first appears. Ultimately, knowledge is paralyzing. And what encourages me is that we're not paralyzed by this knowledge because I think this knowledge we've gained here is actually spurring us to action. And action is exactly what we need. And action in very concrete terms, in our uh, case, translates to implementation of the Baltic Sea Action Plan and of the measures that the contracting parties have agreed to under HELCOM. And I'd like to come back to a point raised by Johanna, which is, all important, again, the price tag. This will require a lot of money, but we need to invest that money if we don't want to be in a position in a few years time where we have to inv invest even more money. So I'll leave it at that, um, but I'd like to say a few um, practical words um, to, to uh, the audience. So this report and all the related documents will be available as PDF downloads online on our website, stateofthebalticsea.helcom.fi. Um, all the whole S3 products will be there, indicator report status, maps, and so on. So if you'd like to, to actually have a closer look, um, you will find it all there. You are, of course, always welcome to contact the uh, Helcom Secretariat, be it me or Yannicka, who is, who is Ms. Holas, of course, um, or anybody else um, in the Secretariat if you need more information on HOLAS, um, on whatever conclusions we draw from that, and on HELCOM policies. And then I'd like to um, once again say a word of thanks. I'd like to once again thank everybody who was involved in HOLAS. I'd like to also acknowledge the major contribution of Lena Bergström, who was actually editing this report for us, and without whose help, I don't think we would have been able to actually um, uh, present it as soon and in the quality that we did. Um, I would like to say a word to our wonderful uh, moderator, Gun. Um, it's always a pleasure. Thank you for being here today and thank you for having done such a great job. And I'd like to thank the panel and all participants of this webinar. And with that, I'd like to once again wish you happy Halloween and a good rest of the day. Thank you very much. <laughs>